Okay, good evening. Um, good evening and welcome to this, the um, third um, online seminar um, that we've hosted. Um, firstly, I should just let you know, um, by way of practicalities, this session is being recorded. Um, and it gives me very great pleasure this evening to introduce my old friend and colleague, um, Dr. Chris Ware from the University of Greenwich. Um, Chris joined the um, National Maritime Museum um, as a curator in 1977. Um, and then many years later, he moved across the road um, to the University of Greenwich, where he's now um, lecturer in history. That's your formal title, I think, isn't it, Chris? Um, he obtained his PhD by published work um, a few years ago. He's written um, very extensively on aspects of 18th century naval history, um, particularly um, Admiral Bing, his 2009 book um, on um, the development of naval infrastructure and so on and so forth. Uh, it's written on Plymouth Dockyard. Um, and that's roughly here, what he's here to talk to us about um, tonight. Um, so the title, Guarding the Gateway to the Kingdom on the uh, Maritime Defences um, of the County of Kent. So Chris will speak usual sort of 45 minutes um, or thereabouts, and we then have some time for questions and discussion. As I said last time, um, there are two ways that you can, can ask a question on this platform. Um, the first is that you could type the question into the chat box um, and I will then read it out when the time comes. Alternatively, if you'd like to ask the question yourself, um, please do just make yourself known in the chat box, just say you'd like to ask a question um, and I will then at the appropriate moment unmute your microphone um, and invite you to, um, to ask it. So I think that concludes um, practicalities for this evening. Um, so without further ado, over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and before the evening, and luckily the college clock has just struck, so we won't get interrupted by large chimes. Thank you, Martin, for the invitation. And also to Claire, who behind the scenes will be seamlessly moving the slides from one side to the other, because as certainly Martin knows, my ability to speak and press buttons at the same time is strictly limited. OK, Claire, if we could have the next slide, please. Thank you very much. What we're going to be looking at, and I was thinking about, is the maritime defences of Kent in the early modern period. And I was taken back. Uh, Martin very kindly reminded me of how long ago it was I joined the Maritime Museum. But my then colleague and actually boss, Alan Pearsall, who we both knew, um, one of his great passions was fortifications. He was actually a member of the fortress study groups and was often chafed about, well, why are you interested in those sorts of things? They're just sort of bricks, mortar, stone, and cost too much and generally don't do a great deal, certainly not uh, in these United Kingdoms. And actually, what we're, I'm going to be looking at is, well, why do we have fixed defences? Because surely the Navy does it all. Well, of course, the period I'm looking at, which is roughly from the 1520s through to, well, I say the early modern period, it may stretch to the end of the 18th, early 19th century. So like all historians, I'll be a little bit elastic. But we start with Dover Castle. Um, and if you look at the Kentish tourist boards, uh, blurbs, this is, of course, the castle, which is the gateway to the kingdom. Uh, and certainly Henry II saw that. And in fact, I think the way English heritage have done it out, they sort of liken it to some sort of, um, I was gonna uh, premier inn or something. It's where travelers would come and stop, um, but a very grand one. On a more serious note, uh, Dover Castle is built overlooking uh, one of the narrow points across the channel. And before formal navies or continuous navies, um, what you needed was fortifications both on land and at sea. And actually, the site of Dover Castle is quite interesting because going back into pre-modern, early modern, um, it's, there's Roman remains. And in fact, there is a debate as to whether Dover or Porchester um, was the base for the Classus Britannicus, uh, the Roman Navy. Um, but certainly there is evidence that Dover Harbour or parts of Dover were, were used for that and the lighthouse, the Pharos, which is in the grounds of the castle, was very much uh, part and parcel of the navigation for that. So it's strategically placed and that's one of the things. It overlooks one of the narrow points if you're going to 
come across uh, and in, invade or have a raid on them, then you need maybe a short point across. Uh, and Dover Castle, um, for those keen eyed, well, it's very much the classics. It doesn't perhaps have the sort of fairy tale sort of uh, roofings and uh, colors, but it's got the high curtain walls that the, the keep in the center. But those sharp eyed will see that towards the front of the, the slide, there seems to be some overgrown ditches and brick walls or brick emplacements. And these are sort of portends of things that come later, that whilst in the 11th and 12th century, high walls could just about stand siege. By the 16th and 17th century, gunpowder had made these ones wonderful targets. Uh, and actually the stone they were made out of also would fracture and break away. So you needed different kinds of defenses. So castles will, and fortifications will change. They will still have walls, they will still have ditches, but they will be supposed low so that they can fire the new weapon of choice, which is not the long the English longbow, even though that lasts well into the uh, 16th century, as Mary Rose attests, the record of Mary Rose attests, it will be the cannon. And the cannon likes a large target. They're not that accurate. Um, and Dover will get its modifications over time. Built in the time of Henry II, it will go through a number of iterations and will remain operational right through until the mid late 20th century in one form or another. Could we have the next slide, please? One of the things that one has to think about if you've got Dover Castle sitting on one end is what do you need to defend? What are you defending from? Well, it's defense or assaults from across the channel. And one of the ways in would be across the relatively sloping beaches. And I've given a slide here of the Goodwin Sands. Themselves dangerous, but actually the coastline on the other side, deal, you can just about make out. And if you squint, you can see there's also Woolmer and Sandown, Sandown as in Sandown in Kent, not the Isle of Wight. Uh, these will be fortification, will become fortifications under the Henry, not Henry the Second, but Henry the Eighth. Henry the Eighth will do uh, between 1509 and 1520, two examinations of the fortifications of, of, under royal command and the vulnerabilities. And Kent. Uh, as we know in Sussex, is a good landing place. There will be descents in the uh, Hundred Years' War uh, on the rivers uh, and coastlines. But the Kentish, the Deal, and the places along like that, where the beach shelves and it's you can bring boats up onto the shore, would be places that you want to defend. So how are you going to defend them? And of course, you what you might want to do is have some kind of fixed defense, because one of the other issues that I'll touch on and happy to sort of expand on perhaps in the questions is that you will think about that even on Henry VIII, who was when he came to the throne in a very good position because of his father, Henry VII's miserly attitude, or actually more than miserly, he managed to get large amounts of money into the exchequer. So when he came to the throne, he had a lot of money to spend, and he did. Not all of it went on sort of gaudery or um, uh, sort of self-aggrandizement in the sort of general sense. A lot of it would go on defense. And one of the things he will do is to look at the coastline right the way around the English Channel, right down to Cornwall and further up around Essex and, and further afield. And they will decide to build a series of things which under an ordinance called a device uh, will be the device forts. And these were ones which many of which still remain to this very day. And they are there specifically to defend parts of the coast. And of course, 
the other reason I mentioned the Goodwin Sands is it's one of the anchorages that if you come inside of the shoals, and you can see, you probably can't see on the size of the slide, but actually it says dry at low water. So those dry out. If you come inshore of that, that's a good anchorage. Shipping coming into and out of the Thames and Medway would often seek shelter as the winds, waiting for the winds and tide. So you may want to protect shipping there as well as def defend, uh, defend the shores. And Henry VIII starts to build these device forts. And the amount that he will spend on that is quite astronomical. Uh, in fact, it's something like, in money of the time, 330,000 pounds. Now, when you think that are probably a century later, the government's entire exchequer revenues were something like two million pounds. You know, go back 100 years, you are talking about a massive investment. Now, some of that is from the money that he'd already got. Some will be from that other act which he is known for, which is the dissolution of the monasteries. And in fact, some of the uh, device forts on the Kentish coast will have a mixture of new stone, some Kentish red stone, some brick, but also materials salvaged, robbed out, if you want, from the monastic houses which are dissolved. But they are designed specifically for artillery. Gone are the big curtain walls, the high curtain walls, like Dover Castle, which we saw in the earlier slide, and in come these low, um, in this case, when we see the next uh, the slide, could we have the next slide, please? This is a an overview. This is a the best I could get of this one. Um, you'll see, actually, it's a series of semicircular semicircular bastions and a central one. Could we flick on to the next one so that people can probably see? Here is a computer-generated reconstruction of one of the ones which still extant deal. And all, nearly all the device forts across the Kentish coast, which are built under Henrikian times on the coast, and certainly the Walmer deal and Sandown, will look like this. Um, what you've got is the sort of idyllic blue sea and small vessels in the offing. And what you've got on shore, we saw in the previous slide, a sort of of an overview, a plan view of these round bastions. And in some ways, I was thinking about this when I did the research for the short chapter I did on this in Maritime Kent. Um, it looks like almost the children's sandcastles that you've just plopped down a bucket and put in them around. And historians being slightly more sophisticated than that, uh, John Hale in his looking at Renaissance warfare, really thinks of these as transitional. They're neither the old fashioned high curtain wall, um, castellated uh, fortifications in the medieval time. These are somewhere between that and the Italianate trace, which if, if any of you do uh, know, which I'm sure you do, about these kinds of fortifications, are those sort of look like sort of stars and points. They've got bastions, ravelins, uh, all those things which make them look incredibly convoluted. These are somewhere in between. They are designed to carry ordnance as their principal means of defense. They've got a dry ditch, they've got a uh, revetted thing, and they are right on the beach, uh, as you can see from this reconstruction. And this uh, fortification deal is has survived although it has undergone various reconstructions that principally it's, it's survived. And something like 40 to 50 pieces of ordnance when it was finally fitted out. And that's the other issue. I said we were going to touch on this. The, the, the subject of money will always come up. Uh, Cicero's comment about this, uh, the sinews of war are infinite finance is true here. Henrikian governments and Elizabethan governments Stuart governments and, dare one say, even the Hanoverians at times didn't always have money to keep the fortifications up. Building them would is a huge expense. Keeping them equipped and manned, if I may still use that phrase, at the time was difficult. The, the garrison outside of wartime would be in about 25 gunners, a lieutenant in command, 
and of course you have to have the obligatory porter who seems to control everything coming in and going out between the forts and on the you, there would have been earthen banks you can just see them starting to be built in the 1540s they were built you had the great earth bank the great clay bank and again they would be cut through with revetments for for ordnance and the other thing to think about is ordnance is new henry loved new technology he loved ordnance so he put them into place uh, and the tower in particular was sort of brim full of these things so most of it would be uh, iron but not all uh, you'd have some bronze uh, or brass guns as well but all of this was expensive and they wouldn't be left particularly the ones between the fortifications along the kentish coast would not be left in place unless there was a clear and present danger uh, and in fact most of the earthworks between the fortifications disappear fairly quickly they go to a huge expense to build them and 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 reinforce them and cut as I say embrasures in them so that you've got several miles of coastline which is quite heavily fortified and the anchorage on the other side now of course part of this is that Henry VIII has made a series of alliances and then changed his alliances and then his wish for glory means that he will go to war with France uh, and so the threat of dissent or invasion will come although in fact it won't come when it does come in 1545 it will be one of the other device forts or a series of them are at South Sea and Portsmouth which will uh, oversee you know the action between the English and the French and the demise of the Mary Rose which by that time was comparatively uh, elderly in terms although she was a major warship but what these forts are doing is making a statement and the statement is that i'm going to look after this coast because as i say they stretch right down to pendennis uh, castle uh, and the foy right around the way around the coast and they of course they're going to, i say of course but going to be in england scotland being a entirely separate jurisdiction these forts and i'll sort of will not actually see action they will be reactivated and that's the problem they fall into disrepair and as any historians know with the navy as well ships are often laid up forts seem to fall even though they've got a small garrison um, they will have to be heavily repaired and the gun platforms restructured and the ordnance return because much of it is taken away and put back into the tower um, so there's this continuous expense so it's it's not a one-off deal that you buy and these are quite substantial uh, the construction of them that the main center the walls allowing for the ragstone on the outside and the filling of chalk and are something like 16 feet thick in places the ceilings less so because they're not designed for taking bombardment by what would later become the bomb vessels but uh, they were still quite formidable and the only time they really came under attack was actually not from the French or any other exterior but it, it was during the English Civil War when royalists held deal in particular and they were besieged uh, by the parliamentarians and it would take some little while for them to be dislodged but it's one of the few times not even during the armada would they come under sort of direct assault could we have the next slide please here's another picture and i've just mentioned about uh, deal uh, and walmer and sandown castle during the Civil War. This is a, a view uh, by a well known artist who made a series of drawings during this period. And again, it is somewhat idealized, but it gives you the idea and even allowing for artistic life. Anybody who has ventured into those device forts knows that they are quite small. I think the footprint, it's the whole of 
Deal Castle is less than in old money uh, two acres, which is about one hectare. It's a small, so it's about 80 to 90 feet from one side of the bastion to the other. It's not a large fortification, but there are series along the coast stretched out. And it was really the earth banks. And so they were almost the, the pivot points for the earthen banks, the great earth bank, the clay bank, which by this point had long gone. They disappeared. Uh, and what you're, what you're looking at is uh, fortifications which uh, will try and change, but they're also built in a way where you're stacking the artillery. You can see some of the embrasures facing inland. So in, at one point, you'd have it three levels. And again, those who study in great detail the actual architecture of these fortifications see this is why they're transitional. They're not really the same as if you looked at Vauban or Cahorn's designs on the continent. They are very much um, somewhere in between uh, the two traditional medieval castle and the artillery fortification. But it does show the importance. And, and of course, I mentioned 1588. Uh, and if we could move along to the next slide, please. This is thanks to the Kent Archaeological Society. This is a reconstruction of something which virtually doesn't exist anymore. There is a, a footprint. This is a blockhouse at Gravesend. And part of the same self same device thing is if you're defending the coast and an anchorage and the approaches to the river thames you want to defend the capital and one part of the way you do that is to have a series of blockhouses on either side of the river thames and this is just one example and because it was it's not a contemporary drawing but actually it's quite a it's just a very nice uh, it gives you an idea of what size and, and where how it's fitted out and again built on the edge of the bank of the bank of the river predominantly out of brick although ragstone used as a base and again you can just see on either side of the, the brick built building you've got uh, embrasures cut into the earthen banks where fortifications uh, more more artillery will be placed, and there were some. There was one down at Higham, and again, if any of you know, sort of Kent, sort of one of the railway stations. There's also one across at on the opposite bank at Tilbury and Tilbury Ness. So you're trying to control, and again, a strategic part of the river Thames to stop people coming further up upstream. And again, they were designed for artillery use and uh, built and i think again there was something like and i haven't done it in mod the inflation calculator on this one as i hadn't with the others something like about two thousand uh, pounds and these are built in the 15 in elizabeth's reign in the 1550s 1540s and will be activated at various points and will be reactivated um when you get to the Stuarts not see any action really they're not significantly involved in the civil wars as were the device forts down on the coast but um, they will be reactivated during the sec particularly the second Anglo-Dutch war but more of that anon but again it just shows you that there is some strategic thought and uh, interestingly enough when we were having the debate about whether to put in coastal fortifications or defences uh, into a book about Maritime Kent. You thought, well, you can't not, but of course they're part of a broader landscape, literally and figuratively. And I've already mentioned Cornwall, Essex, uh, and counties further north. Um, but the shortest point, particularly between France and the Netherlands and or is either across La Manche, uh, the English Channel, or the Southern North Sea. So it is inevitable but that both Essex and Kent, and particularly Kent, will be heavily fortified, and the River Thames itself fortified. Now, interestingly enough, um, this particular works, uh, as I say, only the foundations remain. Um, 
and are preserved. Although in, in latter years, uh, there's been a big campaign to actually try and get them properly preserved. They have been scheduled, but uh, I think they were for a long time privately owned. Um, but even in their heyday, if you can call it that, they fa fairly quickly fell into disrepair because the garrison was quite small. And as with the Navy in the early modern period, pay was often heavily in arrears. So often the garrison would have jobs in Gravesend. They would be plying their trade, whether in whatever works they could get in Gravesend. So they were sort of, then this was not because they were sort of the trained bands, but this was because they just needed the money. The fortifications themselves, uh, particularly in 1588, had to be extensively reworked. Um, the interior timbers had rotted, uh, which is not good if you want to put heavy ordnance in there. So all of this had to be very worked. So again, this, this idea that you're going to have to continuous upkeep, the cost is not a one-off hit. Now that's the same with the Navy, and it is a perennial problem for early modern uh, governments that you don't have enough money to always keep up all of the defenses all of the time. Could we have the next slide, please? Uh, this is a drawing, of a very well-known and famous one about the boom across the River Thames between Gravesend Blockhouse, which was the previous illustration, and Tilbury Fort. You can see Tilbury. And you can also see, I think, just about make out Tilbury Ness and the old blockhouse uh, and North Fleet. Um, and what they're trying to do is control Gravesend and Gravesend Reach. And those of you who know the Thames at all will know it's fairly straight and narrow, even though, of course, it's now been sort of wharfed in on both sides and canal. But at the, even at this point, they're trying to control to stop in this case, the Spanish, you know, um, from coming up any any further. Again, they don't see action at this point, although in 1667, which we will come on to, distressing though that may be, um, they are again reworked and both Tilbury Fort and Gravesend Blockhouse will be brought back into. And if you believe Samuel Pepys, and I know you have to take what he says with a very large pinch of salt, but he does at least have the uh, benefit of being an eyewitness that, of course, many of the, what he calls the sort of bravados, the, 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 young, the young and hot-headed courtiers make their way both to Tilbury and Gravesend because they want to be in the fight. Um, but of course, although the Dutch do come into the Medway, they don't actually get this far, but um, I think the Lord Montague and others are leading the, the bands, the, the trained bands of London, uh, uh, as well as the courtiers down there. So they will be both a sort of an attraction for those who might want to make their own name, but also what they hope would be a viable defence. And I'll say one of the great things about the Kentish fortifications is that they are very rarely tested in the by the opposition. However, he says, however, if we could have the next slide, please. The Dutch in the Medway, the third Anglo, uh, second Anglo-Dutch war um, goes one way and then the other. And then in 1666, when Charles decides to lay up the fleet because he thinks the penitentiaries are in debate, that they, he can't afford. He's had, he spent two million pounds keeping the Navy at sea for the preceding years. And he lays his ships up um, off Chatham and in, in the Medway. The Dutch seek to find an advantage by attacking the, the fleet in harbour rather than an open battle and catch the English completely unawares. The majority of the fleet laid up. The guard ships, if when I did some research, I think that they had a couple of fire ships. We'll talk about the fortifications in a minute. The guard ship was an old fire ship, which when they'd taken it in to have a bottom cleaned in the graving dock, they re removed, I think, a half a ton of mussels. So you can tell that she hadn't moved in some 
considerable time. Um, but the Dutch descend, they land on Sheppey and then they move up the river. Now, as I said about the blockhouse, they don't get further up the Thames, but they are on English soil. So if we might have the next slide, please. This is a Dutch, for those of you with sharp eyes who can see the uh, script at the top, the, the new dockyard, they attack and want to attack the new dockyard, which Peeps, again, in his diary is, discusses walking the ground to lay out the dockyard. They are starting to build a fortification and allowing for artistic license. It will be more in the style of the continental artillery forts. You can see the sort of low walk war, war, and the, the star shape, even though it's, a, and of course the Dutch flag over the top, even though they're burning it to the ground. Um, or burning parts of it to the ground. And they do land and they do march and short, but they also get held up, but not really by the fortification. But the English certainly knew that they were gonna to have to do this. But again, when the Stuarts had been restored, um, they found the treasury minus any real money. And the relationship between Stuart monarchs and parliament was often fractious. It certainly was under Charles the First, and we know where that led. And it was no more; it was as much so under Charles the Second, although he's sort of often typified as the Merry Monarch. He also didn't necessarily want to have much to do with Parliament. He did get large amounts of money. I say something like two million pounds out of Parliament to fight this war. They considered that you know. Again, those who hadn't seen glory in the uh, glory, if such it was, in the uh, civil wars wanted to make their mark in this dispute over trade, uh, etc. The controls of the narrow seas. You pick your topic and choose your your reason for war. But the end result was the Dutch sought a major advantage in terms of the negotiations. And so attacking the Thames and Medway, particularly the Medway, and throttling trade into the capital, which is one of the other reasons these defences are on the Kentish coast and the river, is exactly what they did. If we might have the next slide, please. And they certainly work their way right the way up. Now, originally, in Henry VIII's time, the fleet would have been further down the river towards Rochester as the dockyard and or ships got more numerous and larger, they moved further up, uh, up, up the Medway. And one of the things that was built in the 1560s under Elizabeth, Elizabeth II is Upnor Castle. Uh, this shot is from the sort of, as you can tell, from the opposite bank. So, um, and you can see the sort of, relative size because of the small modern yachts in the front. You've got the water bastion, which is just a visible above the sort of fencing, which is to sort of try and keep people from landing. And, but you also have got the high, relatively high castle walls. Now, one of the things Upnor was to do was again, to control the strategic point. It had two, it controlled supposedly access to the anchorage where ships were in ordinary. It was also designed to help defend the famous or infamous chain. Now the chain is much debated. And for those of you who've been to Chatham Historical Doc, to Historic Docker, there are parts of it on display. It actually moved uh, at, at various points. So it wasn't in, as the fleet moved, it sort of moved and it also fell into disrepair. And to give him his due, one of the things that Peep says that although it was a scramble, Upnor Castle actually did very well. And it was one of the reasons, apart from the fact that although the Dutch certainly wanted to press home their advantage and they wanted to burn and or destroy or carry off ships, you know, it wasn't a, an invasion in the 20th century or 21st century, Upnor Castle held them up. The boom did not necessarily do so. And it certainly put, uh, even though it had to have rapid reinforcements and more guns around it, if you have imagine 
up Norcastle without any of the, the trees that have grown up in the succeeding, it put down quite a su successful fire and actually did hold, hold up. Uh, and as I say, Peeps, who again is uh, not necessarily is an entirely partial witness, but heaps praise on the gunners uh, up north for holding off, even though, of course, as we know, the Dutch do make off with the flagship of, of the Royal Navy. So it's not un, uh, unalloyed um, joy. But up north also has problems because strategically, although it's in a good position for, for some reasons, they want to move the fortifications further down. Those fortifications which the Dutch had destroyed on Sheerness and at the mouth of the Medway were much more propitious for stopping the enemy. So actually by the late 17th and early 18th century, it is going to change. It will stay uh, under the War Office or the Ordnance Board, but it will actually turn into an ordnance store. And I think at its height, it was storing something like uh, 3,000 barrels of gunpowder. So it was a major thing. And of course, the dockyard adjacent to the dock of the Royal Dockyard, Chatham, you'd have the Ordnance Wharf, which of course comes under the separate board, the Ordnance Board. Could we have the next slide, please? I put this one in because this is the Royal Yacht Peregrine saluting up Norcastle. This is Peter Monomy. I put this in for no other reason than it's a splendid painting. And of course, gives you an entirely fictive idea of the width of the river uh, Medway at this point. It's almost as though they're sailing sort of um, through parts of the Solent. It, as I say, it's just a, a wonderful painting, but it shows that Upnor is still there and still active. But at this point, apart from saluting uh, the royal personages as they're coming back into the country, as a military establishment, it is now being repurposed, changed back in, into uh, an ordnance store rather than, a, and if you look at later drawings, and there are quite a lot of that, and also the blockhouse, what happens, and, and you also saw it in the slide on Dover Cusp, you get interior building or buildings built up around it for those who are garrisoned there, for the lieutenant or the captain, if it's more significant. So they become slightly picturesque and you know they start to have, um, formal gardens around them. They lose their warlike nature and take on, dare one say it, almost a heritage look. This is not the case, obviously, in the 1740s when this was painted, but it's starting to happen because people, particularly the officers who were stationed there, um, wanted somewhere to live which was not so dank and dreary, so they might actually build on something with the ordnance boards. Uh, acquiescence, so they become less warlike, which of course means if there is any major uh, conflict, those are immediately impediments to being used as, as operationally. Can we have the next slide, please? Or may I have the next slide, please? Thank you. The other thing that the Kentish fortifications, and again, many historians, uh, and you can, there's the descents on the coast. Um, if you read Sumption's book on the Hundred Weir War or Susan Rose or any historians on the medieval or any modern period, um, you'll find that. But the other thing that 17th and particularly 18th century British governments were, were aware that they had these expensive facilities called dockyards and ordnance wars. And yes, they wanted to protect them from attack and assault up the river, and they'd certainly found out to their huge cost what, what that meant in, uh, the, and it seared into their memories in 1667. But one of the other things was that they might land and get past the coastal defences and then march inland behind the fortification. So what they will start to do is think, can we fortify not from assaults from the sea, but assaults from the land? And this is what the Chatham lines, this is not the Chatham lines, as in when I used to commute backwards and forwards to Canterbury Christchurch to teach, but Chatham lines, as in defences, and you can see just about, I think, in this uh, particular slide, what what I'm really talking about is those zigzag lines are facing inland. So the redoubts 
the covered ways which troops would move along, the countermining shafts, the barracks, the artillery, it was all going to be firing inland and right in the top left hand corner just off the cartouche there's another fortification again artillery which is controlling the medway but this is to defend not from those things coming up the river and upstream but from troops moving inland so that's why they take on this view now the interesting thing that although this is dated around 15 1756 the chatham lines themselves were first mooted uh, under queen anne and in fact, land was identified in, I think, 1712, 13, but it took nearly 40 years to negotiate, remembering that Chatham is grown up, the town of Chatham <coughs> um, around this. It takes nearly 40 years and two thirds of the way through what we now know as the Seven Years War for the first of these lines to be worked. If we may have the next slide, please. This taken from a well-known online encyclopedia of sometimes ill repute, but actually shows you very clearly where the dockyard is, where the gun wharf is, the Medway, but also the various things like Amherst Redoubt, which is now Fort Amherst, King's Bastion, Prince of Edward and Bastion, Sally Port. All of these things, if you were looking at a continental fort, these are the things that you'd, they wouldn't be called the same, but you would have all the same things that by the beginning of the 19th century what you have is a series of defenses which will be reinforced later on uh, under the review under Palmerston in 1859 to 60. I know this is the early modern but the, the groundwork had already been laid and dug. Many of these things are still there, even though, of course, they're redeveloping a lot of Chatham and its surrounds. If you go through Amherst, is very much still there and is open to the public, but some of the rest of the lines are also there. And as on the continent, the problem was that they wanted a clear field of fire. So if you went up to the Cumberland Bastion or Queen Confederates, you were trying to keep people from encroaching and often what happens is you have that clear field on the glassies and out onto the fields out and then you'd have stakes but after the war all of that would be taken up and then people would start to build on it it happened on the continental europe it happened here so fortifications often as with the device forts became sort of encumbered with you know the growth of the population which is entirely right and proper but entirely inimical to their stated purpose. Could we have the next slide, please? And I said we'd go back to Dover because at the beginning, I showed you Dover Castle from one view. This is a plan view and you can see the channel and you can see the general shape. Uh, and again, might look a little small on your screen, but you can see those red splodges are the original things, but then there's those strange earthworks around the outside. Could we have the next slide, please? And could we just stay on that one? You can see very clearly, this is how it is. And you can see in the middle, there's the keep, uh, Dover Castle. And actually this aerial shot is brilliant because that's the new port of Dover with the ferries, but it has also got the old, the old new Admiralty Pier and all those other things. You can see why it's strategically so important. You can see the artillery equipment because you've got the ravelins outside the gate, those arrow shaped, the ditches, all of those low things which are designed and outside on either side, there were new works on the heights and you, the things you can't see, but of course, if you've visited there, you will know in the Napoleonic times, there's the tunnels which will be expanded uh, in the Second World War. But this, what they're trying to do and what they do here, they will also do it at Carisbrook, they will do it at Berwick, and they will do it various, is put artillery fortifications, Italian eight trace fortifications around something that was already extant and try and make it proof. In other words, keep artillery, make it much more difficult because whereas cannon could probably, and 
as was shown in the uh, English Civil War, knock down the walls, certainly the curtain walls of castles, although it was quite tough. If you kept them away, if you've got these fortifications, they have to go through the usual thing of trying to knock out the exterior defences, which is what those um, ravelins and, and, and lunettes round the outside of the fortifications are all about. And then they have to move in and you've got embrasures for more artillery. Again, either in earthen banks because stone is very bad for impact cannon shot, earthworks and brick, brick earth and brick mixed together will crumble and then you will have a defensible position. It won't collapse, it won't just sort of shatter, which is what happens with stone. So I suppose what I'm doing, and I'm conscious that I've got two or three minutes probably to wind up before Martin comes on and sort of asks me to quietly leave, is that they have developed. They are there, but the big problems and big issues are it is easy to either adapt, not easy, but you can do that in relatively short notice. The big issues are can you keep them up? That is a constant of money. Can you get the land, as with the Chatham lines? And the other thing is that in the 18th century, unlike with France, which made a sort of almost a choice between fixed defenses and the Navy, by and large, British governments spent more on the Royal Navy. Now, I would say hurrah to that, but if you're looking to fix defenses, which were equally defense expensive, it's a choice. And what often happens is they are in disrepair and have to be hastily reworked in times of conflict. France, because it's a continental power and you can invade across the borders, would keep it up, would keep them up. So would the Dutch, so would the Austrians, and so would many of the other European powers. Britain had a slightly more ambiguous and ambivalent view of fortifications, but many still stand, and as a deal, warmer, Sandown Castle no longer, but that was less to do with enemy action and just to do with the other concept of coastal defenses that coastal erosion undermined it, and it parts of it toppled into the sea. And I saw that Martin quickly flicked back, so I'll leave it at that. And thank you very much, and thanks, Claire. Uh, that's the last slide. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. I actually turned my webcam on then by accident, so uh, I wasn't. That wasn't a signal to um, to, uh, to to wind up. So my apologies for that. But um, thank you. I enjoyed that. It was very interesting. Um, as I said at the beginning, we've got two ways to ask questions. You can either put them in the chat box or actually the questions box, um, uh, and I will read them out. Or um, I will. Or um, I'll just um, unmute you if you make yourself known and you can ask the question directly. So I'll throw this open to the floor. Do we have any questions? Well, we can't let Chris off that lightly. In that case, I'll abuse chair's privilege and, and ask one if, uh, if people are collecting their thoughts, which is I, I think the way you connect defences and money makes a huge amount of sense for obvious reasons. Um, my question's really about the 18th century, because sometimes it seems to me the 18th century British state was very good at building new things, but not always very good at maintaining some of what it already had. And I'm thinking of the example of one of the Vittling Yards, where they made some reference to the buildings being in a tottering condition, and they had to um, expend some money to build a new privy, the old one having fallen to the ground. That is a quote. Um, so what happened with the fortifications then? I mean, they, they obviously build quite a lot that's new in the form of Chatham lines and so on. But the castles, I mean, were they, as they have been before, allowed to fall into disrepair or was there still a, um, a drive to keep them up in some way? Um, there was some, uh, it's a bit like your things or when I did the work on Plymouth, you know, the Ordnance Wharf was rebuilt because it again was undermined by the, by the sea. Uh, it's the same here. They fall, well, some of them, as they become gentrified, uh, Walmer Castle becomes more and more, well, it latterly becomes the, the seat of the uh, Admiral of the Sank Ports, uh, most famously Wellington's uh, seat, but actually it goes back to Admiral Norris at the beginning, middle of the 18th century. And that means that you start to build more accommodation 
outside of the perimeter of the walls. So some of them fall out. Things like the blockhouses just fall into disrepair, the, those ones on the Thames, with the exception of Tilbury, which then becomes gets a complete makeover by one of the Dutch um, uh, artillery fort spe specialists who Charles II brings in in the aftermath of the Dutch <laughs> attack um, and looks as it does today. So that is kept up and will be active right through until the middle of the 20th century. So some of them very much so, but things like Upnor are just not considered to be, they're kept up to a point where they can store powder, <laughs> but they're not kept up as military fortifications. Some of the other ones, and as I say, the device forts along the, the coast are, um, they come and go, but basically by the 18th century, I didn't mention two other kinds because that's really into the 19th century, but they're going to be supplemented by the Martello Towers and then, of course, the driving of the Royal Military Canal in, from 1804, which is mm. 26, 28 miles. But again, if you look at the, it's wonderful to walk on, it says, I looked at it at the weekend, it says for walking or cycling, easy going because it's flat it's on the edge of the march, but it's also zigzag, so you can have batteries every quarter of a mile which can control that length of canal so they will as you said mm. build new stuff but they won't um necessarily uh they don't have the money and i think it is a, a binary choice navy or the ordnance board and fortifications quite often the fortifications i would say given that as you well know i'm interested in the navy come second mm, definitely uh, right, we've got one question has just come into the um, the questions box, um, so I assume I should ask this um, from Martin Robson says, Chris, how did the Martello Towers fit into these older defences? You've just mentioned the Martello Towers, so there's a nice neat link there. Uh, they fit in very well, and as I say, if, if I hadn't been sort of speeding through, um, what they do is they, I think there's something like 70 around the coast, and they're put in between the... Um, Steel, warmer, what's left of sand down, and right the way around, the, and right down to Rye and across. So they they're interspersed, and the Royal Military Canal is seen as part of that sort of, in which is the other part. So they wanted a layered defence. You'd have the Martello Towers, which have a are even smaller, have less ordnance, but they control a smaller piece of the, and then you have the Military Canal on the inside, particularly on that part of the, and say from. Was it folks today? It's 26, nearly 28 miles of waterway. So they're using the the terrain to us. So that again, they are they are put around. But again, it's if it's three layers. The first layer is the squadron sitting in the downs at certain points under Admiral Keith. Then the Martello Towers. And then when it's finished, the military canal. Mm. Any further questions? Well, in that case, you've got off rather lightly, Chris, but um, thank you once again. I um, found that really interesting and I'm sure um, everybody else did. So in that case, we'll, we'll draw this evening's um, proceedings to a close. Um, one final announcement, which is obviously we have a further Maritime History Seminar one month from today on the 7th of March. Um, the speaker for that is Maria Fusaro from the University of Exeter. Um, Maria, playing her cards close to her chest, as she tends to do, has not yet provided me with a title, which I shall be trying to get out of her in the coming weeks. So um, keep an eye on our um, social media channels and all the rest of it for that. Um, that, we are hopeful, will be a face-to-face -face event in Blades House. So um, watch this space. We hope to be back um, in the building doing seminars in the old-fashioned way um, as of next month. Um, but nevertheless, online has proved um, a very good stopgap um, and we're very grateful to everybody who's um, spoken on this medium and particularly um, this evening. Thank you very much to Chris. Um, it was good to hear you again. It was good to hear the results of recent research. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you, as Chris said, to Claire behind the scenes. Um, and um, uh, thank you, Chris, for a very interesting paper. Oh, it's a pleasure. And good night, everybody. Indeed.